Anyone who has taken an introductory physics class has likely seen the Newtonian derivation for a period of a swinging pendulum. This derivation relies on an approximation of sine. It makes calculations much easier. Because the angle of the swinging pendulum is small enough, it is typical to see the approximation of sine theta as theta. This is actually a Taylor polynomial approximation of the function sine theta. Taylor series are an extremely helpful tool in math, as they allow for the approximation and representation of a function as a polynomial. However, two prominent questions present themselves when working with Taylor series. Firstly, how do we know that if a Taylor series actually converges on a desired function in the limit? Secondly, in the case of finite Taylor polynomials, what is the minimum number of terms needed to approximate a given function to some desired degree of accuracy? For both of these questions, we can turn to Lagrange error. If Taylor series are totally new to you, we recommend you watch 3 blue one Brown's video from the Essence of Calculus series. We'll quickly summarize what you need to know before diving into Lagrange error bounds. Revisiting our sine function, let's zoom in around the point zero, 0. Once we zoom in enough, the curve begins to look more like a line. Of course, this is the essence of calculus, that curves are lines on an infinitesimally small scale. We can use this fact, as we did, to construct a linear approximation around this point. Visually, this is a line whose slope is equal to the first derivative of sine x at um, or when x is equal to 0, which ends up equaling 1. While this line is a reasonably good approximation at the scale, when we zoom out, the deviation becomes clear. At this point, we'll start to graph the arrow with this green function. The deviation between the true function and its approximation really start to increase off to the side. The reason this approximation accumulates an error so quickly is because it doesn't take into account the curvature of the sine function. To deal with this, you can add more terms. By analyzing the error between the approximation and the function, we can prove that not only does the approximation get better, but in the limit, it is the function. So we have this infinitely long polynomial that we think might be equal to sine of x. As we add more and more terms, it certainly seems to approach the function, but we're not sure, and we definitely don't have anything close to a proof. As is common in mathematical problem solving, let's look at a small component first, the error term for a Taylor polynomial approximation. Writing n terms of the approximation centered at x equals a, we have that the function is approximately equal to the first n terms of this series, which comes from the definition of the Taylor series, and we'll just denote that as p n of x, meaning the nth polynomial describing the Taylor series approximation of f of x. Now what's left over is the error we'll call e sub n of x, and that's a function describing the error in the approximation of f of x that uses n terms, p n of x. If we incorporate it into our approximation, we now have the exact equality that f of x is equal to p n of x plus e n of x. Remember, we're trying to show that the limit of the sum as n approaches infinity is f of x. Rearranging, we get an equivalent statement of trying to prove that the limit as n approaches infinity of the error function goes to zero. So as we add more and more terms, we need to be able to show that the error term goes to zero. We still don't know how to express this error function, but now we know what to do and where we're going with it. Let's think about some properties of the approximation as it is now. P sub n of x is an nth degree polynomial approximation of f of x. This means that the n plus 1th derivative of p n of x is 0. This makes sense. All the higher order terms are encapsulated by the error, and thus we have that the nth plus 1th derivative of f of x is equal to the n plus 1th derivative of e n of x, because the n plus 1th derivative of p n of x is 0. Here's the tricky part. Because our function is differentiable across its domain, which we need to have for a Taylor series to be defined, every finite interval has a maximum and minimum derivative of our function. Why? Think through the alternative. If the derivative was unbounded, that would mean there was an infinite derivative at some point, leading to a discontinuity. Since all differentiable functions are continuous, that would be impossible. Therefore, there must be a bound on the derivative, which will denote m for maximum. Now, of course, this could also be a minimum, but we're going to be dealing in terms of absolute values. To find an explicit expression for the error function, we integrate n plus 1 times with respect to x. Remember that at x equals a, where our Taylor series is centered, the error function, as well as all its subsequent derivatives, are equal to zero. 
After integrating, we arrive at the Lagrange error bound for a truncated Taylor polynomial. If we want to limit our error below a given threshold, we can simply use this inequality and solve for n. More importantly, it is what we will use to show the convergence of our proposed, yet still unconfirmed, Taylor series. Let's return to our sine function and see this proof technique in action. The standard Taylor series for sine of x is centered at x equals 0 and is this infinite alternating polynomial, which, when we truncate at the first term, forms a small angle approximation of sine of x approximately equal to x that we talked about in the first section. Note that the maximum derivative of sine of x occurs every integer multiple of pi when it crosses the x-axis at a slope of 1. Thus, by the Lagrange error formula, we have n is equal to 1 and the error function bounded by this expression. Because this fraction has a factorial in the denominator, which grows much faster than the polynomial in the numerator, in the limit as n goes to infinity, it will equal 0, showing that sine of x is equal to that expression. This is one example of the technique devised by Lagrange in order to show that Taylor series converge to the functions to which they're derived. It is a powerful tool that allows us to cross the border from approximation into precision. In Edwin Abbott Abbott's seminal 19th century work of Victorian literature, Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, A square, our protagonist, learns that his two-dimensional reality is in fact a shadow, a mere plane of being within an entire space of existence of three-dimensionality. He learns of this due to an intervention from a special being of Spaceland, a sphere, whose life mission is to enlighten Flatlanders. A square, blessed with this knowledge, begins to question a sphere about possible extensions. After all, what stops there from being a fourth dimension, within which three dimensions is as trivial as a sheet of paper is the Spacelanders? What about five and six, and so on and on and on and on? A sphere rebuffs these comments as ridiculous. But a square is in fact onto something. Towards the end of the 2007 film adaptation, Flatland the Film, we see a square reach the logical conclusion of his ramblings. He falls through Flatland into a mysterious hyperspace whose singularity contains a spinning infinity. He reaches the apogee of awareness that true reality occurs in infinity. With this application of Lagrange error bounds to Taylor series, we hope to have endowed you with the same illumination. Thank you for watching.